Hello, this is Dr. Andrew Singh uh, doing a voiceover for Exercise 24 Special Senses from Allen and Harper 6th Edition Laboratory Manual for Anatomy and Physiology. So in Special Senses, uh, our, uh, six, uh, we have five senses. The touch has been pretty much covered with our previous exercises. So we'll be doing the four other senses in this chapter. That is um, the eye for vision, ear for hearing and balance, nose for smell or olfaction, and then uh, the taste buds for gustation. So we'll start with the eye. All right, um, the eye, the vision is not just by the eyeball itself, but also numerous other accessory structures, including the eye, help in successful vision. The accessory structures include the eyebrows and the eyelashes, um, which are on the eyelid. Um, their function is to, number one, filter off some large debris and dust particles that may come. Um, and also the eyebrows prevent uh, sweat from uh, trickling into the eyes. The eyelids um, help in protecting the eyeball. Our blink reflex is extremely uh, rapid. So whenever there's a small you know, flying particle coming into our eye, we quickly close our eyelids and squeeze our eyelids to protect the eyeball. But even on a daily basis, um, um, without a threat, our eyelids are constantly uh, covering the eye and they help in uniform spread of the tears over the eyeball and keeping the eyeball moist and smooth. Um, the tears also have some uh, enzymes in them that help uh, kill uh, microbacteria microbes that may be uh, coming in contact with the eye. And then we have the conjunctiva. Conjunctiva is a mucosal membrane that lines the inner layer of the eyelid and the outer layer of the eyeball and forms a fold that prevents any foreign objects from the outside to get into the posterior aspect of the orbit. Um, so in this figure, for example, number one here shows the conjunctival fold. All right, so if you see here the brown line, uh, now I'm go gonna go over it with red here, the conjunctiva is attached to the inside of the eyelid here. It lines the inner side of the eyelid. So this is the palpable fold of the conjunctiva, which is number three. Palpebra is the name um, for the eyelid. And then the conjunctival folds around over here. So number one here is your conjunctival fold. And then it comes over and covers the eyeball. But it does not, in this figure, because it's, in this figure it's showing as if it's going over the cornea, but the conjunctiva actually does not go over the cornea. So if it was a pure sagittal section of the eye, uh, the conjunctiva would, and let me erase this from here then. Okay. Um, so if this was a sagittal section, the conjunctiva would come uh, from the conjunctival fold and then would insert on uh, where the cornea begins, right? So this and the lower and the lower uh, eyelid, it would go palpable conjunctiva fold, and then it would end right here. And um, the cornea does not have the conjunctiva, and that's important because the conjunctiva has blood vessels under it. So when we get pink eye conjunctivitis, the blood vessels in the conjunctiva uh, get inflamed. The cornea, normal healthy cornea, uh, does not have uh, blood vessels in it. Blood vessels in the cornea is an abnormality and causes opacity of the cornea and can significantly impair vision. All right. Uh, so number one was the conjunctival fold in this figure. Number two is the palpable conjunctiva. Number three is the bulbar conjunctiva that goes on the eyeball. All right. And so know the functions of all of these accessory uh, structures, the eyebrow, the eyelids, uh, the uh, eyelashes, the conjunctiva, and then the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal apparatus is responsible for production and drainage of tears. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Just want to make sure I covered everything over here. All right. So here, this is figure 24.1 showing the lacrimal apparatus. So number four is the lacrimal gland. Um, that's where the uh, tear uh, is produced. And then the tears come down into the conjunctival uh, sac, if you will, um, through these little ducts and then are spread by the eyelids all over the eye to keep a nice smooth moist layer on the eye. 
and then they drain out through these canaliculi. We have one in the upper lid and one in the lower lid. So number five here is the lacrimal canals. And these canals, the upper and lower canaliculi, drain into the lacrimal sac. And if you recall, when you did the skeletal system, we have a little lacrimal fossa in the skull. The lacrimal sac sits in the lacrimal fossa. All right, and then the tears go from the lacrimal sac and they open into, um, through the nasolacrimal duct, they open into the uh, nose. All right, and now a common clinical feature um, of this is sometimes uh, the lacrimal sac can be inflamed and backed up and these canaliculi can be blocked. If these canaliculi are blocked, then the tears... <laughs> So when the uh, lacrimal canaliculi are blocked, the tears are not able to flow out through their regular path, and then a patient complains of um, watering eyes. Um, and one of the ways this can be diagnosed is if you put pressure over the lacrimal fossa, if you put a finger on, you know, just medial to the medial canthus of the eye and push, you may see some regurgitation, some backed up. Um, and this regurgitation could be just clear water or it could also be colored, discolored water because um, of the inflammation, infection, if there's pus formation in that. That's called dacryocystitis, a very common condition, dacryocystitis. Um, the other condition could be uh, a dysfunction of the lacrimal gland itself. They dry up and they don't make tears. And so patients can get dry eye syndrome. And there are many different conditions. There are autoimmune conditions in which pa patients can get dry eye syndrome. Um, elderly people uh, can have dry eye syndrome. Um, some other clinical implications could be if the patient has had some sort of injury or inflammation in the eyelids themselves, the eyelids heal by scarring, and the scarring makes the eyelids sort of, um, the fibrosis can make the eyelids turn inwards, and therefore these eyelashes that should be folding away and out from the eye instead turn inwards and touch the eye. And as you can imagine, that's an extremely painful condition. Um, so just to name a few clinical applications of the um, lacrimal apparatus. And then the last, um, the accessory structures for the eye would be the eye muscles. All right, so these are, uh, the eyeball has um, skeletal muscles and smooth muscles. The outside of the eyeball has uh, skeletal muscles that we can consciously control. So these are known as the extrinsic eye muscles. We have four rectus muscles. Remember the word rectus means means the, or the fibers are pretty much um, horizontal or parallel to each other. We have a superior rectus. Um, let me go with a black ink here. So uh, number two here is the superior rectus because it's on top, all right? Then we have the inferior rectus. Number six would be the inferior rectus. Then we have the lateral rectus. Number three is the lateral rectus and medial rectus. So in this case, uh, we are able to see the medial rectus on in figure B, number four. This is the medial rectus. And because they're attached, uh, the uh, superior rectus is above, so its action would be elevation or rotation of the eyeball superiorly. Um, it lifts the eyeball. So the superior rectus will lift the eyeball upwards. You can imagine if this muscle contracts, the eyeball goes upward. Inferior rectus will rotate the eyeball downwards. Lateral rectus will move the eyeball laterally. And medial rectus would move the eyeball medially. All right? And then we have two oblique muscles. We have the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. And if you look at it, and let me erase these from here. Okay, so number one, um, is the superior oblique. So that muscle comes around in a pulley, goes around this ring and comes around and obliquely attaches to the eye. You see why it's called the oblique muscle? And in, um, in figure B, uh, number one is the superior oblique. It comes around at the back here go through this pulley and then spreads in an, in an angle like this. Uh, and therefore, this is known as the superior oblique. Uh, the superior oblique muscle is responsible for inferior and lateral rotation of the eye. 
it moves the eye inferiorly and laterally. It also um, rotates the eye. Um, and the inferior oblique similarly comes from underneath. Um, inferior oblique is number five here in this figure. It comes from underneath, goes around the eye, and attaches like this. And so as you can imagine, contraction of this muscle then uh, uh, makes the eye turn superiorly and laterally an external rotation. All right, a lateral rotation of the eye. So these are your six oblique muscles. And remember the innervation of the muscles. Most of the muscles are innervated by the third cranial nerve, ocular motor nerve, except LR6, lateral rectus, by the sixth nerve, and SO4, SO4, superior oblique, by the fourth cranial nerve. All right, so with that, we come to the end of the accessory structures of the eye, and now we'll move on to the structure of the eyeball itself. So coming to the structure of the eyeball itself, basically the eyeball is made up of three main layers. Okay, It has the outer fibrous tunic layer, known uh, the outer the outer fibrous layer. For most of the eyeball, that's the white of your eye. So in this, that's figure six, the sclera. All right. But if you follow the sclera anteriorly, you'll see the same layer becomes that transparent anterior layer known as the cornea. So number one is the cornea. Sclera and cornea are the same tissue technically. They're both very, very strong fibrous tunic layers. The difference between the two is microscopically, the fibers in the sclera are not uniformly arranged. They are arranged in a zigzag manner. And therefore the sclera is opaque to light. The same fibers are very tightly, very well organized and parallel arranged. And I'm trying my best to draw nice parallels and you can see I'm not doing a very good job with that. So if you have very uniformly placed fibers tightly packed in a parallel manner, the same fibers, they make the cornea. So the cornea and sclera is part of the same outermost fibrous tunic layer of the eye. It is transparent anteriorly because of the arrangement of the fibers um, and it is opaque past the cornea because the fibers are mishmash which gives actually more strength to the sclera all right so that's the white of the eye is the sclera the second layer um, is known is the vascular layer and is known as the choroid so here the choroid is number five and i'll go move on with the red ink over here so number five that's the choroid all right um, and this is an extremely vascular layer, very rich with blood supply. It is uh, responsible for supplying the sclera on the outer surface and the retina on the inner surface in the back of the eye. Now, if you follow the choroid anteriorly, you'll see the choroid becomes number four, the um, ciliary body. The ciliary body itself has ciliary muscles, which is number two, and ciliary processes, which is number three. The ciliary processes um, are responsible for production of aqueous humor, the fluid that fills this part of the eye here. Well, sorry, I'll take that back, not the posterior chamber. Um, the, the, the fluid that fills, where am I? I'm going to go with a blue ink. No, I shouldn't use blue. I'll stick with red. Uh, the choroid, the ciliary processes, are responsible for production of aqueous humor, which is the fluid in the anterior chamber. The fluid comes out over here and fills this gap over here. So everything anterior to this line has this fluid called aqueous humor. I cannot write very well with this, but I'm going to try. Aqueous humor, H-U-M-O-R. All right. Uh, the, so pretty much similar to how the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid, is produced in the lateral and fourth ventricles of the brain. And then the CSF circulate and bathes the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid. And then finally is drained in the uh, sinuses, the venous sinuses. Somewhat similar process here. The aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary processes here. 
it bathes the anterior chamber. This part of the eye is known as the anterior chamber and is finally drained out through um, this part number one known as the scleral venous sinus or the canal of Schlem. Um, all right, and the aqueous humor drains out from there. Um, and any blockage to the canal of Sklem or this angle, this angle between the cornea and the iris is known as the angle of the eye. Anything that blocks this canal or this angle can result in obstruction of flow of the aqueous humor. So aqueous humor backs up and collects over here. And just like how backed up CSF can call hydrocephalus in babies and increase pressure in the intracranial cavity that can damage the brain because of the increased pressure. Similarly, a condition in the eye known as glaucoma can occur where the aqueous humor is being produced but it's not being drained. It tends to back up, increases the pressure inside the eye known as the increased intraocular pressure, and that can then damage the sensitive neural tissue, the retinal tissue in the eye. And glaucoma can lead to blindness if uncontrolled and not treated. And there are many, many different causes of glaucoma. There are entire textbooks just on glaucoma. I spent three years in ophthalmology and that's what we did learning uh, about different kinds of cataracts, different kinds of glaucomas, different kinds of retinal disorders and stuff like that. All right, um, so just giving you a quick overview for that. So number one was your scleral venous sinus or your canal of sclem where the aqueous humor drains out. Uh, number two is the ciliary muscles. Now contraction of these muscles it is what uh, changes the, the, uh, the shape of the lens. The structure here is the lens. And lens is attached to, to the ciliary body by these zonules. You see these things coming out? Uh, the lens is suspended in the anterior chamber by these zonules. And as the ciliary muscle contracts or relaxes, it will increase or decrease the curvature of the lens. And that is what helps us focus when we are reading to see near objects. All right, the ciliary muscles are responsible for focusing. Um, number five we did was the choroid. Number six was the sclera. Then we come to the innermost layer of the uh, eye which is the retina, which is the nervous tissue. And this retina is what is responsible for our vision because that's where the neural tissue is. And the retina anteriorly ends at this junction right here. And this is known as the aura serrata. All right, so the aura serrata is a serrated boundary. It lies between the ciliary muscle and the retina. Um, the retina does not come beyond the aura serrata. Retina ends right here. All right, and the retina is the neural uh, layer. It is responsible for vision. And we'll talk a little more about that in detail in a little bit. I just want to make sure we've covered everything in this figure. Uh, number eight is the cornea. And I've already talked to you about the cornea. Cornea does about 80% of the focusing of light, refraction of light, and is responsible for vision. So patients who have a cataract where the lens becomes opaque, if the lens is removed and is not replaced by an artificial lens, the patients can still have pretty decent vision. It's called aphakic vision, vision without the lens. They will not be able to uh, focus on near objects. They will not be able to read because we need the lens for that, but they will still have pretty decent distant vision. Um, um, and still be very independent, like, you know, uh, doing daily chores, like taking showers, getting ready and going in and out of the house. Um, most of the uh, activities they can do, which they would not be able to do if the opaque lens had been sitting here and blocking light. Okay, um, uh, cataract is the most common preventive cause of blindness in developing countries. Um, and, and therefore, in countries that cannot afford to uh, remove the cataract and replace it with a lens, they just remove the cataract so that way at least an otherwise totally blind and debilitated person is able to have what we call ambulatory vision. That means they're able to go about their daily business. So number eight was cornea. Number nine is the pupil. And let me erase all this here. Okay, um, so the pupil is this gap the iris, if you were to look at it from the front, uh, front view, and I don't think the book has that view, so I'm just going to draw it. So if you were to look at somebody's eye from the front, and this is the cornea, you will see the pupil, right? And this is the iris. The iris has radial muscles, 
So it's literally like a curtain. And the iris also has circulatory muscles going around. And it's the contraction of these radial and circulatory. And these are smooth muscles. We have no control over these muscles. And we've talked about their innervation, sympathetic, parasympathetic innervation, and what nerves stimulate that. Okay, so make sure you review that even when you do this. Okay, so this gap in the iris, this makes up the pupil. Number nine is the pupil. Number 10 is the iris. So one of the conditions in which the iris can actually get adhered to the lens, a condition called iritis, um, it'll form fibrous tissue or whatever. It, get, it can adhere to the lens here and then wrinkle up and block the chamber. This is what happens to the iris. This condition is known as iris bombay one of the many conditions that causes glaucoma in patients. All right, and as you can imagine, then the aqueous humor backs up because it's not able to flow out. Uh, number 11 is uh, your suspensory ligaments, also known as the zonular fibers. Now, in elderly people, these zonular fibers lose their elasticity and they become sort of rigid, and therefore the lens loses its ability to focus very well, and which is uh, responsible for press biopia. So if you know people past the age of 40 start needing reading glasses, they need reading glasses because these zonules have become stiff and the lens is not able to focus. And therefore for reading, they need glasses. So between the ages of, um, it starts at the age of 40 and progresses and sort of stabilizes at the age of 60 because at that point they are not um, flexible at all. I mean, that's, it doesn't progress beyond that. All right, so number 11 was your suspensory ligament or your zonular fibers. We have the lens, and number 12 is the aura serrata, the place where the retina stops, and there's just the choroid over there. Now here we have a, a more detailed structure showing the anterior and posterior cavities of the eyeball. So, and the eyeball is divided into an anterior and posterior cavity. The uh, posterior cavity is filled with a thick gelatinous substance called vitreous humor. Okay, uh, so number five is your vitreous chamber that is filled with vitreous humor. It is a thick gelatinous uh, transparent substance. Uh, however, in uh, certain conditions like age, um, and also in high myopic patients, the, the vitreous chamber, the, gelat the gelatinous vitreous uh, uh, can become uh, watery and it can have um, cells and debris floating around in it. And these patients will experience something known as floaters, uh, dark shadows floating around in their eye. All right, so that's the posterior cavity. Uh, and there is a posterior capsule that separates the posterior cavity from the anterior cavity. Okay, number six here is the lens. The lens has an anterior capsule and a posterior capsule. And then we have lens fibers here. And the cool thing about the lens is the new lens fibers are formed in the periphery and the old lens fibers get pressed uh, into the nucleus. Um, and therefore, in elderly people, you will see the older degenerating fibers will actually form an inverted Y shape in the center because that's how they get squished. All right. So we have an anterior and, and in cataract surgeries, what they do is they make a cut in the anterior uh, capsule. They remove this anterior capsule. And I'll see if I can remove this. Oh, it removes almost everything. OK, so that's the anterior capsule removed. And then the lens is removed, trying to leave the posterior capsule intact. A damage to the posterior capsule means we have gained access into the vitreous uh, posterior chamber, and that is a complication of cataract surgery. You can't do that. All right, no, you shouldn't do that. Um, so that is the lens over there. And everything anterior to this posterior capsule is your anterior cavity. Now the anterior cavity is divided into two chambers, the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So one is the anterior chamber, that lies anterior to the iris, and two is the posterior chamber. 
okay? And the anterior chamber and posterior chamber put together make up the anterior cavity. And remember, the, um, the ciliary processes is where your aqueous humor is produced. It goes through the posterior chamber, comes around, and through the pupil gains access to the anterior chamber, and then from here is drained out um, through the uh, uh, scleral venous sinus or the canal of Schlem. All right, so um, anterior chamber, posterior chamber, anterior cavity, four is your canal of Schlem, five is your vitreous um, chamber, and six is your lens. This here is the cornea, this here is the sclera, these are the ciliary muscles, this is the ciliary body, or the ciliary processes. This is the choroid here, and way past down here, past the ora serrata, would be your retina. All right. Um, we were supposed to do <laughs> dissection of the eye, but we're not doing that. So um, this is just showing you the structures of uh, if you were to dissect a cow eye. So just trying to identify all the structures in the eye. These would be the extrinsic muscles of the eye. And if you had the orientation of which eye that was, you would be able to identify superior, inferior, medial, and lateral rectus muscles and the superior and inferior oblique muscles. But we, since, since we don't have that orientation, we can't quite do that. This is the optic nerve leaving the eye. Here is the cornea or the clear of the eye. And this is the sclera or the white of the eye it would be the sclera. All right, and remember the conjunctiva, if you were to be able to dissect the conjunctiva, you'd be able to remove a transparent layer here, but it would be adherent in the front to the cornea, and it would be adherent, you know, it would go around like this. Um, it would not go past into the posterior chamber. And this is if the eyeball were to be uh, cut um, in a sagittal section, sorry, a frontal section, um, so you have an anterior half and a posterior half, if you will. Um, so this would be the posterior half sh showing the retina, and the optic disc is where the um, optic nerve leaves the eye, and the vascular structure is the choroid. The outer thick fibers, you see how thick and fibrous it is? This is the sclera. It's really, really tough. It's like leather, uh, and it's not easy to cut. Sclera is not easy to cut. Um, and then uh, on the anterior half, you can see the real vascular uh, ciliary muscles and the gap in the ciliary muscles that make up the pupil. You can see the transparent cornea through it. Um, and the iris. The iris is pigmented. Um, and it's um, if you look at the iris through the laser, um, it's, it's a very beautiful structure. And while doing a laser iridotomy, um, the pigment on the iris sits like, like powder on a butterfly's wing. So when you hit it with a laser, the powder just goes poof. And, f you know, you see little pigment uh, powder in the floating around in the anterior chamber. So now we come to the anatomy of the retina. Um, fundoscopy is a study routinely done by an ophthalmologist to look at the fundus of the eye, which is the back of the eye. So what they do is they dilate the pupil of the patient. So the pupil is fully dilated, so you have pretty good access to look inside the eye, because otherwise if you put light into the patient's eye, the pupil will constrict and you will be only able to see a small part of the back of the eye, of the fundus of the eye. In order to get to see the entire, you know, as much of the fundus as possible, it is important to dilate the pupil. So once you dilate the pupil and look directly through the ophthalmoscope into the back of the eye, this is what you see. All right. Um, it appears the, the pink glow that you see, the red eye, like if you see a deer in, in the headlight, sometimes you see the red eye. Or when you take photographs and you get the red eye effect, what you're basically seeing is the light that went from the flash of the camera or from the headlight of the car hit the back of the eye, reflected off the pigment layer of the retina and comes back to you. And while it's doing that, it actually goes through the blood vessels and comes back out. So you're seeing as if it went through a red glass. And that red color is what you're seeing is from the blood. 
So that's known as the fundal glow. If there is an obstruction in the fundal glow, you know something's opaque. So any opacity in that pathway of light, whether it's a corneal opacity, an opacity in the lens, an opacity in the vitreous chamber, any opacity can cause a shadow in the fundal glow. All right. So what we're seeing here, I'm going to start with this structure here, and maybe I'll use a black pen for that. This white structure here, this is the optic disc. This is the part where the optic nerve leaves the eye. I was supposed to use a black ink. Okay. This is the optic disc. This is where the optic nerve leaves the eye. There are no photoreceptors here, and this is responsible for the blind spot because there are no photoreceptors here. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about the details, the molecular structure of the retina. Um, so besides the optic uh, nerve leaving the eye here, the central retinal artery enters the eye and the central retinal vein also leaves the eye from the same spot. The central retinal artery divides into superior temporal branch, inferior temporal branch, superior nasal branch, and inferior nasal branch. And then similarly, we have a mirror image of the superior temporal vein draining out, uh, inferior temporal vein draining out, superior nasal vein draining out, and inferior nasal vein draining out. These are the four main blood vessels supplying the retina. Another important part of the retinal circulation, this is one of the end arterial circulation. That means there is no anastomosis. So if you remember when we did the digestive system or the circulatory system, um, most of the organs in the body have a backup blood supply. So if their main uh, blood supply is obstructed for whatever reason, they may have collateral circulation to preserve the organ from undergoing permanent damage because of ischemia or hypoxemia. Uh, retina is one of the structures that does not have collateral. So if the retinal artery were to supply this part of the retina, and for whatever reason the, the retinal artery gets blocked, this part of the retina does not receive blood supply, and this part of the retina will have ischemic damage. All right, central retinal artery occlusion or just a, a branch occlusion of this uh, retinal artery is a, a commonly seen phenomena because of numerous vascular, um, uh, cardiovascular conditions. All right, um, this central part of the eye, which appears slightly darkish in color, that's the macula. Macula is responsible for our central and uh, uh, vision of the eye where we have good color vision, good visual acuity. The density of photoreceptors is really high here, especially of cones. Cones are your photoreceptors responsible for color vision. So cones are very sensitive to light. They are responsible for color vision and they're responsible for visual acuity. A lot of that happens right here in the in the macular area, and in people who have macular dis, uh, uh, dystrophy or macular degeneration, uh, uh, these are the people who have difficulty with visual acuity. They are not able to see or read fine prints, and they may have a central blind spot, if you will. So that means if you're looking at a book and you're trying to read a letter, that letter will be missing, but you'll be able to see everything around that letter, but your acuity is not so good, so you still can't read. And every time you move your eye to a position where you think you can see, you've moved your macula there and therefore you've moved your blind spot. So it's like having a blind spot right in the center of your eye, and it's extremely frustrating. Um, eclipse burns, uh, snow blindness, all that is damage to this area, to the macula, all right? And right in the center of the macula, and if you look through an ophthalmoscope, sometimes you see it as a, as a light shining back at you as a reflection. It's just a small dot. That central dot, that's your uh, fovea centralis or your central fovea. So when you're reading fine print, say you're looking at your book at page 375 and you're reading a fine print, you're reading, say, labeling of this figure, uh, figure 24.6, and you're reading the word blood vessel and your eye is focused on the letter B. That letter B, the image of that letter B when you're looking at it, that is falling right here. This is where that letter B is falling when you're looking at it. Get it? So that is responsible for exactly where you're fixating. That's your central fovea. All right? 
Um, so the macula lucia is also known as the macula because this is the flat central part because there are no um, uh, bipolar or ganglion cells here. It is, this has purely just photoreceptors. And when we go through the thickness and the layers of the retina, um, I, will I will mention this again. Um, this is the thinnest, flattest part of the retina. It has the highest density of photoreceptors, the best visual acuity. And as you move away from the macula lutea, all of the photoreceptors, uh, they synapse with the sensory neurons. Those sensory neurons will be on the periphery here and they synapse here. So in a cross section, the retina is extremely thin here and it kind of sort of bulges here before it flattens out for the rest of, because all the ganglion uh, for the photoreceptors in the um, macula are all arranged right here around the macula. So this area is actually thicker because it has more cell bodies here, all right? So let's move on to the next figure. I just want to make sure I got everything covered here. So number one is your fovea centralis. Number two is your macula lutea. Number three is your blood vessels. Uh, number four is your optic disc. Um, this is showing a model of a transfer section through the eyeball. If you all look at this here, the yellow is the retina. And do you notice how the retina is is really really thin at number five that's your central fovea and it kind of sort of thickens from this part to this part that's your macula lutea and you see how it's a little bit thicker over here than it is in the rest of the retina uh, and that's because a lot of your uh, bipolar cells that these photoreceptors in the center they relay with the bipolar cells just outside the macula lutea and that's why it's thicker over there so five is your central fovea, uh, four is your central retinal artery entering into the eye, uh, two is the central retinal vein leaving the eye, three is the optic nerve leaving the eye, um, and number one is the optic disc. All right, so this whole thing here, this is all the optic disc, and the optic disc is responsible for your blind spot, and we'll get to that in a minute. This is showing, again, a photomicrograph of an eyeball. Uh, number uh, six here is the cornea. Number seven is the pupil. Number eight is the iris. Number nine is the ciliary body. Um, number 10 is the lens. Number 11 is the choroid. Number 12 is the sclera. Number 13 is the retina. Number 14 is the optic disc. And number 15 is the optic nerve. Here we come to the microscopic structure of the retina. The retina is made up of many, many layers, okay? Now the light that enters the eye enters through the pupil, goes through the lens, goes through the entire posterior chamber, all the way through the thickness of the eye. It goes through all the structures of the retina and finally hits this opaque layer of photoreceptors. All right. So if this, you know, if so, if this was the cornea, and this was the eye, and this was your lens, my drawing is not very good with the mouse. All right. And 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 let me go with a yellow, a yellowish color. And this was your retina. And at the bottom of this retina, you had your photoreceptors. I'm going to draw the retina with yellow. Da, 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 da. So here's your retina, the neural layer of the retina, and then you have your photoreceptors, which is the innermost layer just outside the choroid. Okay, so when you have light coming in, light goes in through the cornea, through the lens, through the posterior chamber, goes through all the layers of the neural retina till it hits the pigment epithelium. All right. Um, so the light has to go through all these layers of the retina 
to, uh, and number six is your pigmented epithelium of the retina, and that's what blocks the light and keeps it from reflecting back and forth. So if we didn't have the pigment epithelium, for example, patients who have severe, um, who are albinos, they do not have pigmentation in this layer. They have glare, really bad glare, because what happens is the light then can bounce around inside the eyeball, and that causes really bad glare. Imagine the light coming in through, uh, and therefore uh, uh, albino people have real difficulty being out in bright light. All right, um, so number six is your pigment epithelium. Once the light bounces through here, as it does that, it triggers the photoreceptor. So number four, IO photoreceptor layer. Now, if you remember from the previous exercises, our special senses, we have photoreceptors. We have separate receptors. They are not part of your sensory nerve. Your photoreceptors will stimulate, will synapse with the sensory nerve and create an action potential, trigger an action potential in the sensory nerve. So this is your special senses. These are your photoreceptors. They are different from free nerve endings as we saw in the skin. All right, where the dendrite of your sensory nerve itself is part of your receptor. Okay, it's not. Here, photoreceptor is a separate cell of itself, and it synapses with the sensory uh, nerve. So number four are your photoreceptors. We have two basic different type of photoreceptors, rods and cones. The, uh, the central part of the retina, uh, the centralis, has more cones in it. They are sensitive to light. They are responsible for color vision. They have better visual acuity. Rods. Um, uh, can function in dim light. Uh, they are more in the periphery. Uh, they help us see things in the dark, and they're also sensitive to movement. They are not sensitive to color, and therefore at night, uh, you will notice your color vision is not so good. And at night, when you're looking at an object and something moves in your peripheral vision, you'll be able to tell there's something there, but you will not be able to necessarily recognize it because your visual acuity is not very good in the periphery because that's been picked up by the rods and you will not be able to identify its color because rods don't have color vision. So the two kind of photoreceptors we have are rods and cones. And then we have three different types of cones and I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, these photoreceptors then synapse with the bipolar cells. Again, if you recall the chapter on the different kind of cells, we have unipolar, bipolar, multipolar cells. Unipolar cells we already talked about were in the skin, right? Where the ganglion is in the posterior root ganglion and the dendrites uh, go out to the periphery and make up your sensory receptor and the axons then go into the spinal cord. Those were your monopolar, unipolar uh, neurons. Now we come to the bipolar neurons where they have the dendrite that synapse with the photoreceptors and then their axons will synapse with the ganglion. So these purple guys here in number three, um, they are your bipolar cells. And as you can see here, you have those green cells and blue cells. There are many different type of cells. And this layer itself is not labeled in this figure, but this is a outer plexus and inner plexus layer. And there are many different kind of cells even within the ganglion. Uh, within the bipolar cell layer and the ganglion cell layer, but we're not getting into those details. So we're just gonna stick with the photoreceptor, um, the pigmented epithelium, the pigmented epithelium, the photoreceptor cell, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. The dendrites of the ganglion the synapse with the axon terminals of the bipolar cells, and the axons of the ganglion cells are what make up the optic nerve. So it's these axons of the ganglion cells that are leaving the eye. So now remember the ganglion is in the retina. This is what makes the retina an outgrowth of the brain. This is the only part of the brain that is actually visible from the outside. Is when you look into the eye and look at the into the uh, retina, it is a part of the brain that we are seeing because we have ganglion cells out here. All other senses, if you look at your previous chapter, we're not able to see any ganglion cell externally. This is the only organ in which we are able to see. So you're technically looking at the brain when you're looking into the retina at the, uh, while doing a fundoscopy. All right. 
So number one is the optic nerve fibers or the axons of the ganglion cells. Number two is the ganglion cell layer. Number three is the bipolar cell layer. Number four is the photoreceptor layer. Number five is your neural portion of the retina because number six is the pigmented epithelium of the retina. It's not the neural part of the retina, but it is still the part of the retina. And here's the important thing. Uh, retina is attached to the choroid and other layers of the eyeball at the optic disc. This junction between the neural retina and the pigment epithelial retina is a very weak junction and can be separated. There is a condition known as retinal detachment in which these two layers separate and the neural retina floats off into the posterior cavity. Um, so going back to this little figure that I drew here, in retinal detachment, what will happen, and I'll go back to a yellow. Um, in retinal detachment, what will happen is that, and let me erase this. In retinal detachment, the retina will be attached at the optic disc and the rest of the retina will literally be floating in the posterior chamber while your, your uh, pigmented epithelium still stays attached here pigmented epithelium is still attached. So the two layers, the neural layer and the pigment epithelium of the layer of the retina can actually separate and fluid can collect between them and the retina can detach. And this is common in patients with, uh, you know, with very high myopia and other conditions. All right. This is a photo micrograph, again, showing the different layers of the retina. The outermost layer is the sclera. Then you have the vascular choroid. Number 11 is your uh, uh, pigmented epithelium of the retina. Number 9 is your layer of photoreceptors. And number 8 is the bipolar cell layer. Number 7 is your ganglion cell layer. And the axon of the ganglions is what makes up the optic nerve on top. And 10 is your uh, uh, neural portion of the retina. So this is the layer in retinal detachment. This is where the detachment takes place. The neural layer separates from the rest of the eye. Now talking about the blind spot, what I'd like you to do is look at this figure. Um, look at the black dot and close your left eye. What happens to that cross? Don't look at the cross. Don't look at the X on the right side. Keep looking at the black dot. Focus on the black dot and put your hand in front of your left eye. What happens to that cross? And I need you to sit a, distant, a, a decent distance from the screen. Do you notice that that X disappears? And if it doesn't disappear, Keep focusing on the black dot and move either a little bit closer or a little bit further away from the screen and you will come to a point where that X disappears. That X disappears because its image is falling on the optic nerve and you don't have any photoreceptors over there and therefore it's a blind spot. All right. And similarly, now what you can do is look at the X, focus on the X and now cover your right eye. All right. What happens does the black dot disappear and if it doesn't disappear just sway a little bit forward a little bit back and you will come to a point where that black dot will disappear that is because its image is now falling on the optic nerve and that's how you are able to see your blind spot now we are consciously not aware of our blind spot and there's a whole theory on that i won't get into that um, but basically there are no photoreceptors in your blind spot and therefore you can't see the image of something that falls on the blind spot so when you go to the doctor to get your eyes checked uh, one of the most common things they do is that they look for visual acuity okay so you are made to sit in a chair and the room is darkened and then they put on this chart um, in front of you and it's usually about 20 feet away and if the room's not 20 feet long it's usually about 10 feet long and the chart and you have a mirror in front of you and the chart is actually over your head so the image of it is 20 feet away and then you're asked to read this is exactly similar to remember the two-point discrimination test I talked about in sensitivity uh, this is again can your eyes can your photoreceptors distinguish the different shapes of these letters and numbers 
at what point are your eyes unable to distinguish the shapes and recognize the shapes and that is your visual acuity all right um, and it doesn't mean your, if your visual acuity is not accurate, doesn't mean there's something wrong with your photoreceptors per se. It could be because of the length of the eyeball. If you think of the eyeball as a camera, and if you've done, you know, your physics in high school, you'll know how the image falls through the pinhole camera. And if you move the screen back or forth, then the image can fall too short or too far off from the screen. And that's uh, your... Um, um, far-sighted or near-sightedness. So if your vision is 20-20, uh, you are considered emetropic. All right, that means at 20 feet, you are seeing what most of the people see at 20. Why do we keep it at 20 feet? Because at 20 feet, our zonular fibers, our lens is at the most relaxed position and the uh, rays coming in, the light uh, coming in from the distant object is almost parallel to each other. And we don't need any um, uh, focusing of the lens is not required to see distant objects uh, 20 feet and further beyond that. And that's why we use 2020. So if you're able to see at 20 feet, that's emetropic. Uh, e However, if you are far sighted, that means when an object is br brought closer, it gets blurry. Then the patient is said to have hyperopia. Um, one way to imagine it is if the eyeball were a little bit shorter and the image of the object was falling behind the retina, that's hyperopia. The opposite, if you have good near vision but blurry distant vision, so you're nearsighted and you need glasses to see distant vision, that is called myopia. In this case, you have to imagine the eyeball is elongated and the image is falling short of the retina. The retina is behind where the image is falling. That's myopia. So corrective lenses are worn to make sure that the image falls right on the retina to get a clear image. All right. And I already mentioned about press biopia. Uh, in order to see near objects or normal healthy adults, should be able to see um, near objects because their lens should be able to focus because their zonules are nice and uh, um, soft and they're able to contract and your ciliary muscles are functioning fine. All right. However, with age, the zonules become stiff and the lens um, capsules become stiff and the lens is not able to focus. So a near point regresses. So normal healthy adults, a near point is about 10 centimeters. By the age of 40, that moves back to about 20 centimeters. And as we age towards 60, the near point goes further back to about 80 centimeters. That condition is known as presbyopia, and, we, and that is then corrected by reading glasses. Another uh, condition called astigmatism is um, so astigmatism is when there is a difference in the curvature of the cornea. So the cornea is not um, perfect. All the images are not perfectly aligned coming in from different parts of the cornea. Um, one of the way astigmatism is measured is we have this chart here the astigmatism chart and the patient is asked to cover one eye, look at the center with the eye that's open and see if all of these lines appear equally distinct, clear and parallel. If any of these lines are either dim or not straight and parallel, um, and that means that patient has astigmatism and um, they need what's called cylindrical correction. All right, patients with astigmatism usually present with very, very severe headache because the ciliary body tries hard to correct for that astigmatism. And because the ciliary muscles get fatigued, that causes severe headaches. All right. Now, finally, we come to color vision. As I said, our cones are responsible for color vision. We have three different types of cones in our body, red, green, and blue cones. Majority of the cones are red. About 64% of the cones in our body are red. 34% are green and 2% are blue. We need all three of these to be stimulated at different frequencies for us to see all the different colors that we see. All right. Um, so all the different colors in the spectrum that we are able to see is because of different level of stimulation of the red, blue and green cones in our body. Now, there are some uh, 
genetic disorders in which uh, patients may not have uh, the, the red-green color blindness and one of the most common inherited disorders. But some people may have uh, only green blindness um, or total color blindness. And one way to detect color blindness is by Ishihara's charts. So here is an example of an Ishihara chart plate number seven. There I think, I think 32 plates, if I recall correctly. There are 32 plates in the Ishihara color blindness test. And what happens is, so for in this particular plate, um, if you do not have color blindness, if you have normal vision, you should be able to see the number 74 instead of a greenish color in the center, while all the other circles are sort of, you know, shades of reddish, reds and oranges. All right, and you have these different shades of uh, green and teal, if you will, in the center. Uh, showing the number 74. So normal vision people should be able to see the number 74. However, patients with red-green color blindness will see uh, the number 21. And patients with total color blindness would only see spots. They will not be able to see any number on this. And so each plate in the Ishiara chart actually helps to identify different types and different degrees of color blindness. All right. Um, here is another plate, plate 16 from the Ishiara color blindness test. Um, again, people with normal color vision should be able to see the letter, uh, the number 26. You see how the the shades of two and six are different. Um, the red color blind people will only see six; they will not be able to see the two. The green color blind people will only be able to see two; they will not be able to see six. So you see how each chart is different and what patients see is different. And there are many professions that require a person to undergo color test or test for color blindness before they are um, able to pursue that career. Um, color blindness can be an X-linked disorder. That means it's passed down through the X chromosome. Um, women can be carriers and may not have color blindness um, and it can skip a generation and is seen in the males in uh, the second generation. So very rarely, uh, if the woman has both X chromosomes with the colorblindness gene, then the woman can have colorblindness. But because men have one X and one Y, uh, if they get that one X with the colorblindness gene, they are always colorblind because the Y doesn't compensate for it. All right, so that's how um, it affects men more than it affects women. And it can skip a generation because even though a woman can have one X with the color blindness, the other X makes up for it. So the color blindness is not uh, perceived by the woman. With that, we come to the end of um, uh, the eye and vision, and we will move on to earring, um, ear and hearing. So now we come to the ear. Ear is responsible for hearing and for equilibrium. So it does two functions. The ear is divided basically into three regions. The external outer ear, the middle ear, and the internal or the inner ear. The external ear is consistent of the auricle, also known as the penna of the ear. That's the outside that you can, the, the part that we see. Um, so uh, the external ear consists of the auricle, the external auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So in this figure, uh, number two is the auricle, number 12 is the uh, external auditory canal, and number 11 is the tympanic membrane. Now, as you can see, the auricle um, has, a, 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 the auricle is a flexible external structure, um, which we call the ear and its function is to collect sound waves um, and direct them towards the external auditory canal. Now, we human beings don't have the greatest sense of uh, hearing, but if you look at animals, say for example, a dog, you, uh, and if you notice how they can perk their ears up and they can change the direction of their ears, depending on where the noise is coming from or where the sound is coming from, um, that is the job of the oracle. It is to, you know, um, change directions to allow um, accuracy of sound, to allow accuracy of perception of the sound. Um, but in human beings, we have very limited movement of the auricle of our, hear, of our ears. Um, the rim of the auricle is known as the helix. So here, number three is the helix of the ear. 
um, and the um, fleshy inferior portion is known as the lobule. That's the part that's usually pierced, you know, for earrings and stuff. So the soft fleshy part is a lobule. Um, and the helix has cartilage under it. Um, and again, remember uh, diseases or injuries that can damage the cartilage of the ear, the cartilage does not repair itself. Um, so that does not um, regenerate and repair. So therefore, injuries or diseases that damage the helix of the ear, they usually require uh, plastic surgery. Uh, cartilage from the ribs is usually taken and remodeled and shaped to replace the cartilage of the ear. All right. The external auditory canal, number 12 in this figure, its job is to conduct the sound waves from the auricle to the tympanic membrane or to the eardrum. And the tympanic membrane is um, uh, you know, one of the first most vital organs for hearing. It, is, uh, it converts the sound waves into vibrations that are then transferred to the middle ear. All right. Uh, so, and, and right there, the middle ear ends. Uh, the, right there, the external ear ends and the middle ear starts there. So the middle ear is an air-filled cavity. So this um, part here, um, I don't want to mess up the diagram. Um, so what's behind the eardrum, behind the blue part, this dark uh, reddish part, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, but this dark part um, is known as the middle ear. It is filled with air. And that is very important that the pressure on either side of the eardrum be equal because if pressure on any one side is higher then it pushes the eardrum in the opposite direction and that causes two problems number one it causes pain because the eardrum is an extremely sensitive organ um, so it causes severe pain number two it will then not uh, our hearing is compromised if the eardrum is pushed the eardrum should be able to vibrate to sound. But if the pressure on two sides between the external and the middle ear is different, um, that can uh, impede the vibration of the uh, eardrum, which then impedes our, impedes our ability to hear. And that's the role of the eustachian tube. Number 10 here is the auditory tube, also known as the pharyngotympanic tube. It's called pharyngo because it opens in the pharynx. Um, over here, it opens into the pharynx. Okay. Um, and therefore, if you uh, if you ever caught a flight, and when the flight takes off, you feel like um, sort of a deafening, and then when you swallow or chew a gum, you hear a popping sound, and that popping sound is where this eustachian tube opens, and the air that you swallow. Um, passes up through this tube and make sure that the air inside the middle ear reaches the same pressure as the outside ear because as the airplane takes off the atmospheric pressure decreases. So the external ear is at lower pressure and the internal ear is at higher pressure so the eardrum tends to be pushed outwards and some people can experience ear pain during that time. Uh, because this part of the tube can sometimes be very, very narrow and be blocked. When we have cough and cold and congestion, again, if this tube undergoes congestion, it's lined by mucous membrane. If undergoes uh, congestion or if there's a mucus plug or something during um, because of our infection, um, this tube gets blocked and therefore our ability to equalize the pressure between the two sides of the tympanic membrane can be uh, compromised which causes ear pain and again um, any pharyngitis or infection in our pharynx can travel up the eustachian tube and cause middle ear infection very very common in children and this can get uh, can get filled with the fluid or pus or whatever and if the pressure is too much it can actually rupture through the uh, membrane um, um, and, and anyone who's experienced this will know how painful it is when the middle ear is filled with uh, fluid and actually it is a huge relief when the middle ear, when the eardrum actually bursts and this fluid is allowed to get out um, the pain disappears instantaneously but then um, 
uh, hearing is compromised. The eardrum can heal really fast. There will be scarring when the eardrum heals and it can affect hearing. And therefore, many a times when uh, children or even an adult, when they have middle ear inflammation and there's collection of fluid in the ear, they usually do a procedure called uh, myringoplasty where they go in and put a clean surgical incision and they may even put a tube in the ear, in the eardrum, which allows the fluid to drain out on its own. Um, and with time, as the inflammation reduces uh, and the eardrum heals, the tube can be either removed or it will fall out on its own and the he eardrum can heal with minimal scarring and therefore minimal auditory deficit. All right. Um, the middle ear uh, has three bones. Uh, number five here is the malleus, that is the first bone. These three are the smallest bones in the human body. The first is the malleus. Um, it, is, uh, uh, it is the outermost bone. It is attached to the tympanic membrane on the outside and to the second bone, the incus, on the inside. The incus is number six. Um, and this is attached to the uh, malleus on the outside and to the stapes on the inside. Um, stapes being the third bone is attached to the incus on the outside and to the oval window on the inside. Okay, this is the oval window right here. And that's the end of the middle ear. Um, the oval window and the round window um, and everything past this, that's the in inner ear. So number nine is the inner ear. Um, making sure I've covered everything before I move on. So I'll just go over all the parts real quick here. Uh, number one is the lobule. Number two is the oracle. Number three is the helix. Number four is the external ear. Number five is the malleus. Number six is the incus. Number seven is the stapes, which is attached to the oval window. Number eight is the middle ear. Number nine is the inner uh, internal ear. Uh, number 10 is the auditory tube. Number 11 is the tympanic membrane. And number 12 is the external auditory canal. All right. Um, and then we will come to the inner ear. So just remember everything past the, um, the stapes. Stapes attaches to the oval window. Then we have the round window here. These are the semicircular canals. So we have three semicircular canals. They're all at right angles to each other and they are responsible for uh, um, motion detection and equilibrium. And this um, sh uh, shell shaped stuff is called the cochlea and this is responsible for hearing. And this is the um, vestibulocochlear nerve. And as you can see, it's got two branches. The cochlear branch is responsible for hearing and the vestibular branch is responsible for equilibrium. And we'll talk a little more about that as we move forward. All right, so now coming to the inner ear. The inner ear is housed within the temporal bone. It consists of cavities within the bone, and, it, uh, and this cavity is known as the bony labyrinth. The bony labyrinth encloses a series of connected membranous sacs, which are known as the membranous labyrinth. Now the bony labyrinth itself is filled with a fluid known as perilymph and the membranous labyrinth is filled with a fluid called endolymph. All right. Um, the bony labyrinth has three main regions. The vestibule, uh, which is number nine. So this gray, uh, so number nine is the vestibule. Um, the utricle, which is number five. And the saccule which is number six, all right? So if you see here, we've got these three structures. All right, these three structures, <clears throat> uh, these three structures make up the vestibule. Um, the bony labyrinth itself has three main regions, uh, the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. So I already pointed out what the vestibule is. These are the semicircular canals, and then this is the cochlea. All right, so these are the three main areas of the bony labyrinth. Um, and as I said, uh, the vestibule is made up of, um, all right, 
Um, so the vestibule is the middle area of the bony labyrinth. It contains uh, encircles two sections of the membranous labyrinth. That is the utricle and the saccule. And I've put here V for vestibule, S for the saccule, and U for the utricle here. Um, so you can tell the pink areas are the parts that are the membranous labyrinth. All right. And uh, both the utricle and the saccule contain equilibrium receptors. Um, these are receptors that help us in our equilibrium. And we'll talk about that in a little more depth as we move forward. The semicircular canals, these are the three bony canals that are posterior to the vestibule. All right. This, those three pink loop like things. And each one of them is at right angles to each other. So think of it in, like an x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. Each one is in a different, is at 90 degrees angles to each other. And each of these semicircular canals, so number one is your uh, anterior semicircular canal, number two is the posterior semicircular canal, and number three is the lateral semicircular canal. All right, and each of these canals has an ampulla. The ampulla is that widening end of each semicircular canal and a duct. So you see how the ampulla then opens into the utricle. Uh, the ampulla of each one. So right here is the ampulla, this part. Each canal has this ampulla, which then opens into the um, utricle. All right. Um, uh, uh, the semicircular canals are filled with a fluid and, uh, and have teeny tiny hair inside them. Okay, and every time we move, our head moves, that fluid inside the semicircular canal moves and it moves the hair. Okay, and these are the receptors. Um, and that's how we get a sensation of moving. And that's why when you are, say, spinning around in circles, even after you stop spinning, you feel as if your head is still spinning. That's because this fluid inside your semicircular canals is still moving. And so those hair are still being stimulated. And so the nerve is still being stimulated. And that's why you continue to feel dizzy for a little while till the fluid stops moving. Okay, And that's how we get our sense of movement and uh, equilibrium, if you will. And this sensation is carried by the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Then the cochlea is the spiral shaped area in the bony labyrinth. And this is the part that has receptors for hearing. And this too has fluid in it and has little hair like cells in it. And these are responsible for hearing. And um, I think we'll go into a little more depth here because um, as we go in the different parts of the cochlea, the frequency of sound that stimulates these hair varies. All right. Um, and therefore, people who are around a certain sound a lot, like people who live near train stations or people who live near airports, they will have that specific frequency of sound. They'll be exposed to that spe specific frequency of sound a lot more. So hair cells in that area can get worn out. And if they get worn out, those people become deaf to those frequencies. Um, and that's how that occurs, is that these little hair inside the cochlea get worn out. Um, and even loud music can damage these hairs. So people who listen to loud music a lot during their life, as they grow up, they can have uh, damage to their cochlea because of damage to these hair. And then they become deaf to certain frequencies. Um, so I think I covered everything here. Let me make sure I covered. Um, so number one was your anterior semicircular canal. Number two is the posterior semicircular canal. Number three is the lateral semicircular canal. Number four was the ampulla of the semicircular canal and duct. Number five um, is the utricle. Number six is the saccule. Number seven was the oval window, this little pink uh, line. Um, number eight is the membranous semicircular duct. The pink areas in the semicircular canal, that's the membranous semicircular duct. Number nine is the vestibule. And number 10 is the round window um, that is going into the cochlea. Number 11 is the cochlea itself. And number 12 is the cochlear duct. 
All right, so now we come to the microscopic anatomy of the cochlea and the organ, the spinal organ of Corti, which is what helps us uh, here. So basically, um, remember in the previous diagram I showed you the cochlea is that spiral shaped organ. It is made up of three turns around a bony core. Now, if you were to imagine that you unturn, uncoil the cochlea and straighten it out, I've tried to sort of draw that here. So right in the center in the purple, which you're seeing here, that's your cochlear duct that you've opened up, okay? That's the cochlear duct. Um, above it is the scala vestibuli, uh, the one in the sort of orangish yellow color. And the membrane that separates the scala vestibuli from the cochlear duct is known as the vestibular membrane, which lies superior to the cochlear duct. And inferior to the cochlear duct is the scala, um, is the scala tympani, and that, um, is separated from the cochlear duct by the basilar membrane. However, uh, if you look at this coil structure, and I hope it's clear here, uh, because there wasn't a diagram in the book that showed it, so I sort of drew it here. So if you look at the purple line here, and I'm gonna try and sort of fill it in here, this purple line, this is the cochlear duct, okay? And above it, I've tried to draw this as the scala vestibuli, the orange part. And then below it is the green part, the scala tympani. But however, if you go to the uh, innermost coil, do you see how the two are actually connected to each other? So they're all basically one, the, the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani is one cavity and it contains uh, a fluid in it. Uh, the, uh, the perilymph. All right, so that is one cavity that contains the uh, fluid perilymph in it. The cochlear duct is a separate closed cavity. And within the cochlear duct, we have our spiral organ of Corti, which is responsible for hearing. So in this figure, it's like a cross section through the cochlea. So, you, so the multiple coils of the cochlea are seen here. Uh, number one is your scala vestibuli. So on top, what I've shown here as the orange. Um, and number two is the scala tympani below it. Number three is the vestibular membrane, uh, which is separating the scala uh, vestibule from the cochlear duct. Number four is the basilar membrane, which is separating the cochlear duct from the uh, scala tympani. Number five is the cochlear duct itself. All right. And number six is the spiral organ of Cordy. All right. And now we're going to take a closer look at the spiral organ of Cordy that sits inside the cochlea duct. So spiral organ of Cordy, it'll be like right here. It sits like this. Okay. And it's all along the cochlea duct. Now here we're seeing a cross section through the spiral organ of Cordy. So to give you an uh, orientation again from the previous diagram, number seven here is the vestibular membrane. Remember vestibular membrane was the membrane that was separating the scalar vestibuli from the cochlear duct. Uh, number eight is the uh, tectonic uh, tectorial membrane. We haven't talked about that just yet. Number nine is the basilar membrane. Uh, that is the membrane that separates the cochlear duct from the scalar tympani. And number 10 are the hair cells that are responsible for hearing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And number 11 is the cochlear duct. All right, so this is the cochlear duct. Uh, number seven is the vestibular membrane. So on top of this is your scala vestibuli. Um, and number nine is your basilar membrane. So this is the basilar membrane. And below the basilar membrane is your scala uh, tympani. Got it? So this inside this whole space here is basically your cochlear duct. Now within the cochlear duct, you have the spiral organ of Cordy. Now this spiral organ of Cordy uh, contains hair cells, number 10. Those are the hair cells. These are your receptors for hearing, okay? And also has some supporting cells. 
and the hair cells have hair bundles that are composed of the uh, stereocilia at, the, at their apical end. Um, superior to and in contact with the stereo uh, with the uh, stereocilia is the tectonic membrane. So your tectonic membrane that is your number eight. Okay. So the basal end of these hair cells, they synapse with the sensory and motor neurons from the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Movement of the basilar membrane caused by the perilymph movement forces these hair bundles into the tectorial membrane and bends the stereocilia. This results in generation of nerve impulses in the sensory neuron. Got it? So that is kind of sort of how we hear. Um, and remember, as we go along the spiral um, length of the cochlea, the frequency with which these hair particles are stimulated changes. Um, so we have, you know, lower frequencies on one end, higher frequency on the other end, um, and all of that is not really, we haven't gone into that much depth in the book here. Um, so with that, we come to end of hearing, and now we'll move on to equilibrium receptors in the inner ear. So uh, coming on to the equilibrium receptors in the inner ear, we have two equilibrium receptors. The maculae, uh, these are located in the utricle and saccule. So if you want to refer back to a figure 24.14 and identify where the utricle and the saccule is, the macula are located within that. And then we have the cristae that are located within the membranous semicircular ducts within the ampulla in the ampulla of the semi of the semicircular ducts okay the maculae provide information on head position that is static equilibrium and also as linear acceleration and deceleration you have to think of it uh, when you're sitting straight the macula are uh, are um, vertical so only when there is linear movement when your head moves forward and back as if you're going in a car and the car suddenly accelerates or decelerates then those maculae, those fibers are stimulated and your head gets the position, um, gets the feeling of either moving forward or moving backwards or, or stopping. All right, so this uh, figure here shows the macula um, and the number one here are your otoliths. Otoliths, the, the word oto means ear and lith means a stone. So these are like little stones, if you will, in your ear. Basically, these are like crystals. Um, uh, these are crystals sitting on a gelatinous membrane. So number one is the otolith, which is a, a crystal, and number two is the otolithic membrane. And if you can imagine when your head um, is accelerating or decelerating, these crystals tend to move, and which puts a pressure on, on this gelatinous substance, which then moves the hair follicle. Number three is your stereocilium in the hair bundle. This moves the hair bundle, which uh, uh, triggers the um, hair cell. Number four is the hair cell. And then number five is the vestibular branches um, of the vestibular cochlear nerve. All right, and that's what stimulates the nerve. Um, these crystals are uh, calcium carbonate crystals sitting on the gelatinous membrane. All right, so maculae are responsible for head position, which is static equilibrium, and for linear acceleration or deceleration, which is dynamic equilibrium. All right, then we'll move on to the cristae. All right, now these cristae are located in the membranous semicircular ducts within the ampulla. And these are responsible for rotational acceleration and deceleration, uh, not linear um, acceleration and deceleration, but rotational, which is a different kind of dynamic equilibrium. Um, and over here, number six is the cupula, number uh, seven is the hair bundle, and number eight is the hair cell itself. So what happens is that each crista consists of these hair cells and its supporting cells. The hair bundles of the hair cell are covered with a gelatinous st uh, structure called the cupula. And when the head moves, the movement of endolymph, uh, remember all of these membranous labyrinths are filled with endolymph. That movement of the endolymph pushes the cupula, 
which causes the hair cells uh, to bend and this bending generates a nerve impulse which is um, picked up by the vestibular branches of the vestibular cochlear nerve and that's how we detect rotational movement and if you remember there are three ampulla in all three of the semicircular canals each one at 90 degrees to each other and that's how we are able to detect rotational movement in any direction between x y and z axis our head is rotating in some direction and each of those semicircular canals would be stimulated at a different level depending on which direction uh, or on what axis our head is rotating all right. Um, and before we finish uh, the year, there are sep uh, there are many different tests done to uh, look for deafness and for loss of equilibrium. So deafness, there are two kinds of deafness: conduction deafness or sensory neural deafness. Conduction deafness means that the ear is not able to conduct the sound, the sound waves through the external ear and the middle ear to the hearing receptors in the inner ear, and that's why it's called conduction deafness. Some of the reasons for conduction deafness could be ear wax buildup, uh, damage to the tympanic membrane, um, uh, also fusion of the auditory ossicles if the bones fuse together. You remember these bones are joined by synovial joints. Um, so some sort of a joint diseases can cause them to fuse together and become stiff. So they're not able to conduct sound anymore. So there are numerous different causes of uh, conduction deafness. Sensory neural deafness, as the name itself suggests, is damage to either the hearing receptors, damage to the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, or damage to the neural pathways, or even damage to the auditory cortex. So anything uh, from the hair cell onwards, uh, from the inner ear onwards, damage at any of the pathways could be a cause of sensory neural deafness. Um, some of the tests done in clinics uh, are called Weber's test, Rene's test, um, uh, so for Weber's test, uh, a tuning fork is taken, you strike the tuning fork, and then you put the tuning fork in the center of the forehead. So you put it on the bone, the frontal bone. Now remember, bones conduct sound faster than air. All right. So if the sound is heard equally on both the ears, then either the subject has normal hearing or has bilateral deafness, is equally deaf in both the ears. If the subject hears the sound louder in one ear, um, then either uh, the, uh, the uh, if the if the subject hears the sound louder in one ear, that means one ear uh, is deaf. The person has unilateral deafness. Then the question is, which ear and what kind of deafness? So either the patient has conduction deafness in the ear that hears it uh, um, louder, or has sensory neural deafness in the opposite ear. All right. So in Weber's test, sound is louder in the ear with conduction deafness. All right. And that's again because bones conduct uh, sound uh, better and faster than air. So in the normal ear, the sound conducted through the air in the external ear canal is more like background noise. So the ear, the deaf ear will actually hear the Weber's test better. All right. Um, and then if the subject has unilateral deafness, the second test to conduct would be the Rene's test. All right, so in the Rene's test, what you do is you again strike the fork, and this time you put the vibrating fork on the mastoid process of the ear. Again, because um, the bone conducts sound better, uh, the patient will be able to hear the sound. Ask the patient to tell you when the patient can no longer hear the sound, and then lift the tuning fork, which is still vibrating, and place it near the ear. Now you're looking for air conduction. If the patient hears the sound again, then the subject does not have conduction deafness. But if the patient does not hear the sound, then the patient may have conduction deafness in that ear. All right? And lastly, what you can do is also test um, the hearing by air conduction. So again, you, you can strike the tuning fork and now place the tuning fork near the subject's ear. Ask the subject to tell you when the subject can no longer hear the vibration of the tuning fork. And then place the still vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid process for bone conduction. If the subject now starts hearing that sound again, that means there is conduction deafness in that ear. All right, so that's how you can dif distinguish between conduction deafness and sensory neural deafness. Now coming on to testing for equilibrium. Um, 
again, equilibrium receptors uh, can be damaged because of uh, numerous um, conditions, uh, vertebra, vertigo, inner ear infection, chronic labyrinthitis, um, vasal or artery insufficiency are some of the conditions that can cause um, um, uh, conditions like a vertigo, nystagmus, or dizziness. The difference is uh, there are two kinds of equilibrium as we talked about. Static equilibrium, that is knowing the position of the body relative to the forces of gravity, knowing whether your body is standing straight or is lying down or is upside down, that's your static equilibrium. And then there's dynamic equilibrium, that is, is your body moving? Are you rotating? Are you accelerating? Are you decelerating? Are you moving forward or backward or whatever? That's dynamic equilibrium, okay? Any inflammation or injury or tumors or uh, whatever have you to the receptors can result in the inability of the body to perceive um, equilibrium. And this usually manifests as vertigo, uh, which is a sensation of circular motion. Either you feel you are moving and the world around you is still, or you feel that the world around you is moving and you are still. All right. Um, and dizziness is slightly different. It is more a sense of faintness, unsteadiness, lightheadedness. All right. So vertigo and nystagmus is a whole different field by itself. I mean, there are people who specialize just in that. Um, because uh, eye movements are involved in this too. So a lot of people with vertigo will sometimes have nystagmus, and nystagmus is a rapid involuntary movement of the eyeballs. And nystagmus has a fast component, a slow, slow component, and again, it is a whole field by itself. So we won't get into details of that, but then there are a couple of tests that are done to look for nystagmus or a loss of equilibrium. All right, the test for equilibrium, we can test for static equilibrium and for dynamic equilibrium. For static equilibrium, it's pretty simple. You ask the patient to stand still and close their eyes. Uh, when they don't have visual input, they have to depend on their um, receptors to able to maintain posture. All right, and there are many causes by which the patient can lose that sense. One of them is because of damage to static equilibrium feedback. All right, so um, uh, and, uh, so that is uh, the test for static equilibrium. Testing for dynamic equilibrium is um, Barney's test, but this is something, you know, as children, we've all sort of experienced it. Basically, what you do is you sit on a stool or you make the subjects just sit on a stool, you know, take sure, make sure you take safety precautions, have the uh, subject tilt the head a little bit forward and downwards, and then spin the stool around. OK, um, you know, at a decent speed, something like 10 turns every for about two for a few seconds. And then you stop the stool. And then does the patient, does the subject still feel as if the patient is going around? That shows that their uh, dynamic equilibrium receptors are working fine. Now, if you look at the subject's eyes, you will see a little bit of back and forth nystagmus, like movement of the eyes. And depending on which direction the eyes move, it can actually tell you which semicircular canal was uh, still moving. And you can change the posture of the head. So do it once with the head tilted forward, do it once with the head tilted backwards, or the head tilted to the side, and you will know. So, um, I would encourage you to read page 386 to get a good idea about what the Barney's test is like. And um, again, if you have time to do it with a um, uh, with a person and see if you can make these observations, because if you actually do it, there's a good chance you're going to be able to remember it better. All right. And so with that, we finish our ear and equilibrium. So now we come to the nose and the sense of smell known as olfaction. All right, so the olfactory receptors, these are found within the olfactory epithelium. And the epithelium is the specialized area which lines our nasal, ca uh, nasal cavity. The olfactory epithelium covers the inferior surface of the cribriform plate. That's the part of the skull. Um, the, the olfactory epithelium covers the inferior surface of the cribriform plate, the superior nasal concha, and the upper part of the middle, uh, middle nasal concha. The epithelium contains olfactory receptor cells, supporting cells, basal stem cells, and ducts of olfactory gland. The olfactory receptor cells uh, which are uh, number five in this figure. The olfactory receptor cells, these are the bipolar neurons whose dendritic end 
is embedded in the mucous membrane covering the surface of the olfactory epithelium and their axons form the olfactory nerve, which synapses with the olfactory bulb. So if you think about it technically, this part of your nasal mucosa um, is exposing technically the brain. This is one part of the brain that is exposed to air. So you can understand how delicate that is. However, because it is so protected, because it is up in the superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha, um, we, we are more uh, liable to injury than for infection because our nasal mucosa really is our first line of defense. And in the respiratory system, um, you know, we've talked about the cilia and how they filter the air and they take the debris out and we have enzymes and stuff that take care of the bacteria and any microbes that can be coming. So that's why from an immune standpoint, we are really protected. But physically, um, this is the part of the brain that is literally exposed. And that's the, that's the thing you have to remember about um, olfaction and about vision. Um, in olfaction, this is the only part where the brain is exposed to air. And in vision, the retina is you, the only part of the brain, if you will, that we can visualize, we can look at in clinics. All right. Uh, so the olfactory nerves are passed through the olfactory foramen in the cribriform plate and they synapse on the neurons of the olfactory bulb. And these nerve impulses then travel up along the olfactory track to the lateral olfactory area of the cerebral cortex. So in this figure, number one is the olfactory bulb. And if you remember in the chapter of the brain, it's really, really hard to see the olfactory nerve because it's so small. Those little red lines that you're seeing uh, in number two, that, though, that's your olfactory nerve technically. So two is the cribriform plate that the olfactory nerves go through the little holes in the cribriform plate. And number three is the olfactory tract. All right. Number four, as I said, is the olfactory nerve that's going through the little sieve in the olfactory plate. Number five is the olfactory receptor cell. So, um, and number six is the olfactory hair, the dendrites of the receptor cells. All right, and that is your olfactory nerve. Now remember the olfactory uh, sense, the sense of cell adapts really rapidly. We've talked about adaptation um, in the previous chapter and in the previous senses, our skin can adapt to temperatures. Our uh, temperature receptors can adapt to temperature really fast. Our eyes can adapt to light and dark over time. Similarly, our olfactory receptors can adapt to smell. So sometimes, um, you know, when you think you want to follow a smell, but you don't smell the smell anymore after a while. So you have to get away from that environment and come back into that environment a little bit later to be able to smell that smell again. All right, so our olfactory sense is really good at adapting. So now we come to taste buds and uh, gustation. So taste buds are found on the tongue, on the soft palate, the pharynx of the throat, and the larynx. All right, um, we have basically um, the taste buds are located in papillae, and we have about four different types of papillae on the tongue. First are the valid papillae. That's number one in this figure. And as you can see, these are large papillae, and they form an inverted V shape in the posterior part of the tongue. Number two are the fungiform papillae. Number two in this diagram are the fungiform papillae, and they form mushroom-shaped um, papillae, and they are scattered all over the tongue, uh, all over the surface of the tongue. Number three in this figure is the foliate fab papillae, and these are present mostly in children, and they're located along the lateral margin of the tongue. And finally, four are the filiform papillae. These are slender pointed projections that cover the surface of the tongue, and they give the tongue their rough textures. These papillae have tactile receptors, but they do not have taste buds. All right, taste buds are only found in the previous three uh, papillae, the valid, the fungiform, and the foliate papillae. All right, now coming on to the taste buds. So if you look at a detailed structure of the papillae in uh, B, or figure 24.18B, uh, number five is your valid papillae, and the little purple things at the bottom, the little blue things at the bottom, those are your taste buds. So valid papillae have taste buds. Number six is filiform papillae. They do not have taste buds. 
Number seven is the fungiform papillae, and they have taste buds as well. And number eight is showing the image of a taste bud. Now coming down to C, we see an enlarged um, diagram of what a taste bud looks like. So the taste bud itself has a um, taste pore. So number nine is your taste pore. The taste buds themselves are uh, onion-shaped structures. They contain gustatory hair, which are your um, sensory organs. The gustatory hair and the um, uh, supporting cells. The gustatory cell has, each gustatory cell has one gustatory hair that projects through the opening, through the taste pore, on its apical end of the taste bell. And the gustatory receptors are located on the gustatory hair. The basal end of the gustatory has synapse with the dendrites of the sensory neuron. Again, remember these special senses, we have a separate cell as the receptor cell that then synapses onto the sensory neuron. So at the base of the uh, cell, the gustatory cells will synapse with the sensory neuron and the axons of the sensory neurons um, then go up the sensory nerve. And if you remember again, when we did the cranial nerves, uh, the, the sensory fibers can be carried up through the facial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve, through the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the ninth nerve, and through the vagus nerve, which is the tenth nerve, again, depending on the location of the taste bud. Um, now, what are the different kinds of taste? We have primarily four tastes, sweet, bitter, salty, and sour. Um, and there's a possible fifth taste, and there are variations between individuals. Some people are able to taste monosodium glutamate, and some are not. All right, gustatory receptors are most sensitive to sweet and salty sensations, and these are found at the tip of the tongue, while bitter sensations are in the back and sour sensations are on the sides of the tongue. Other taste sensations are a mixture of all of these different uh, four, uh, four tastes. Uh, smell, temperature, and texture contribute to our sense of taste. Um, so a person with a cold often has a loss of a taste due to the loss of smell. And that's what, it's the taste, the smell um, put together that gives the food its quote-unquote flavor. All right, cold French fries are not as tasty as hot ones. And again, mushy apples are not as good as crisp apples. So it's not just the taste, it's also the texture, the appearance. Um, and this is again a known concept in um, um, you know, eating habits and eat, eating disorders, if you will, that the more senses that are stimulated when we eat, the less quantity of food we need to eat in order to satisfy the part of the brain known as the satiety center that tells us, okay, I am done, I am full, I, I need to stop eating. That sense of fullness comes quicker with less quantity of food the more senses we stimulate. So the color of the food, the smell of the food, the, the, the texture of the food, the more senses that we get involved while in the process of eating, the quantitatively we need less food to feel satisfied. And that's one of the many problems that we have with fast food. We don't, get the, we don't take the time to appreciate their color, their texture, their smell, and therefore quantitatively we tend to consume more um, to feel satisfied. Um, which is uh, a reasonably well-documented reason for uh, obesity and numerous other eating disorders. Cerberus will get it by the time you go back. Um, with that, we come to the end of this chapter. There's a neat little activity in this, and um, this is something I know we did when we were in school as little kids, is see if you can identify food just by their taste. So if you pinch your nose, you don't get to smell it, and you close your eyes, you don't get to see it and do this with a subject. See if you are able to identify common foods like you know, carrots and bananas and apples or uh, potatoes or cheese or anything. You'll be surprised that uh, many people will not be able to identify a food by taste only. If their nose is closed and if their eyes are closed, if you don't get to see your food or touch your food or smell your food by taste alone sometimes, certain foods are really difficult to identify. And that shows you um, the role of all the different senses being stimulated when we eat. All right, so with that, we come to the end of this chapter. Again, I encourage you to do the exercises in the back of the book. Um, see if you can answer these questions. And if you can, you are set for the exam. Um, this one right here is showing you uh, parts of the retina. Just make sure you go over these questions. This is on page 397. And this is an interesting um, 
example of a visual field. Um, so here you can see A is normal field. This is what an eye normally sees. Number B is an abnormal field. So you see how the central part is uh, blurry and the peripheral part is clear. This is a clear example of a macular defect. So this could be macular degeneration. This is what snow blindness and eclipse blindness can look like. All right. But the opposite if the periphery was blurred and the center was clear, that's known as tunnel vision. And tunnel vision is a pathognomic hallmark of uh, conditions like glaucoma, where the periphery of the retina starts undergoing damage because of uh, long-term intraocular pressure uh, increase. All right. So in glaucoma, you'll have tunnel vision. That means the periphery is blurred and only the central vision is pre uh, preserved, or rather I should say central vision is the last to be lost. So visual field defects. And um, visual fields is a whole different field and we won't get into that. But just I need you to know the difference between a macular defect and a tunnel vision. So this one here is macular defect. And if I were to draw if you were to see the same thing, the center is clear, but the periphery is blurry. This would be macular defect. Uh, this would be tunnel vision, uh, typically seen in glaucoma. Okay. So. Why do you have to? You know, you may get like a match the following the defect to condition. Uh, so you'll be able to do that. And I think that's the end of the chapter. All right. Thank you, and good luck.